Jazakallah khair. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. Just out of the spirit of helping us to uh, transition mentally into a new position, I'm going to read a page from Surah Al-Kahf, inshallah. So it'll help us to calm down. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan al-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi alladhi anzala ala abidihin kitab wa lam yaja'al lahu iwaja qayyiman liyunzira ba'san shadidan min ladunhu yubashir al-mu'minin alladhina ya'maluna as-salihat wa yubashir al-mu'minin alladhina ya'maluna as-salihat anna lahum ajran hasana makithina fihi abada وينذر الذين قالوا تخذ الله ولدا ما لهم به من علم ولا لآبائهم كبرت كلمة تخرج من أفواههم إن يقولون إلا كذبا فلعلك باخع نفسك على آثارهم إن لم يؤمنوا بهذا الحديث أسفا إنا جعلنا ما على الأرض زينة لها لنبلوهم أيهم أحسن عملا وإنا لجاعلون ما عليها صعيدا جرزا أم حسبت أن أصحاب الكهف والرقيم كانوا من آياتنا عجبا إذ أوى الفتية إلى الكهف فقالوا ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا صدق الله العظيم Okay, Bismillah wa salatu wa wa rasulillah. Those verses didn't have any particular connection to what we're going to do, other than I think that it helps us to transition. Um, another thing that will help us to transition in the great Egyptian tradition is Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sallam. You know, salli ala Nabi. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Tasleema kathira. Okay, Bismillah. Um... <laughs> That's a funny story. My son. This is what my son just did. So my son, obviously, is almost two and a half. Anytime he starts getting a little bit fussy and making whining noises and stuff, we tell him, use your words. Right? Use your words. Express what's going on. Use your words. So my wife just told him, mommy's not happy. Izzy needs to be nice. Ismail needs to be nice. So Ismail told her, use your words, mommy. Use your words. <laughs> so, kids are great. They know exactly how to push your buttons, even at the age of two. Uh, alhamdulillah. So, our topic is Dr. Betty Shabazz. Dr. Betty Shabazz. Um, rahimahullah. May Allah have mercy on her. And she was, as Zubair mentioned, the wife of Malcolm X, Malik al-Shabazz, rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy on him. Um, Malcolm was assassinated 50 years ago this year. So 1965, February 21st, 1965. And uh, Betty, uh, she's known as Sister Betty, and she's also known as Dr. Betty was born May 28, 1934, and she died on June 23, 1997. Um, one of the things that you see throughout this, this is a relatively, it's a pretty good biography, and it's a really nice read. Um, I personally think that, I, I may have mentioned this last time, that reading biographies and autobiographies is very important because uh, it, it, it gives us a window into wisdom and knowledge that we would otherwise have to fail in our own lives in order to acquire. So that's part of the reason why it's important to have communities, why it's important to speak to one another, why it's important to spend time with elders and all these kind of things, because you learn wisdom from them. I tell you, I did this, this is the mistake I made, these are the things that happened to me, this is how I dealt with it, and so on. And so uh, this is obviously a substantial book, it's, it is still smaller than the autobiography of Nelson Mandela, which I would also highly recommend. But this is a, it's, a, it's a good text. I didn't read through all of it out of full discretion. I read through certain portions and different chapters, but I found it to be um, very interesting. There's uh, a couple of things that kind of, you know, you leave with. You leave with 
a feeling that Dr. Betty was a very strong woman and a very motivated woman, uh, but she was also a real human being. You know, she, she went through a lot of difficulties. When, she, when, when Malcolm was assassinated, they already had four daughters. And she was pregnant with twins, which later on was two more daughters. So she was in the position of raising six daughters by herself, right, after the assassination of Malcolm. And Malcolm didn't leave with any money. He, he died broke, basically. The only thing that helped the family, actually, in the aftermath was his, uh, his autobiography, which, you know, the autobiography initially was intended, the proceeds of the autobiography were initially intended to go towards the nation of Islam. And when he had his split with the nation of Islam, then, alhamdulillah, he made the proceeds of the autobiography go to his family. And this was what was left for his family, uh, along with whatever charitable things people would give them. But in the end, she was one woman, six daughters, and she was by herself in a world that was not very, um, in many ways, supportive. You know, I, I think that now when we look back on Malcolm, first of all, we look back on Malcolm from a Muslim community perspective where we assume everyone likes Malcolm. But that's not the way it actually is. Usually a lot of elements up to today of white America are very, you know, skeptical about Malcolm. Uh, but at least he's attained to a lot of uh, respect and acceptance among minority groups. But that was not the case when Malcolm was assassinated. So we, we should not forget this. That when he was assassinated, a lot of people were happy that he was assassinated. A lot of people were not mourning. Uh, and so she, it wasn't like a world of all of these friends that she found herself in. As time passed and people began to look at his legacy with more objectivity... Uh, that started to shift. So it did help her in some circles from the beginning, but it didn't help her in many others. But over time, it helped her uh, in a lot of different places. So what I'm going to do is just... Um, we'll try to tie an activity into it at the end. But what I want to do is I just want to pick out some different passages from here and reflect upon them uh, with some lessons that I think are relevant to us as as you know young people or older people or people who are trying to live good lives, there's a lot to be taken here. So this, this first one is from a chapter called Bahia. And uh, you will get to know why it was called, she, she called herself this. But there's two things on this page. The first one is she talks about, or they talk about how she, she dealt with a lot of fear after Malcolm's assassination. Um, and, 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 you know, these things, it's, it's not clear how long they lasted afterwards, but the threats and things to the family did not cease with Malcolm's passing. So, for example, they moved into some suburb area and her kids were going to school and so on. And it says that one day she got a call at the house and the person said, your daughter's wearing a very nice dress today. All right. So this is after he's done, after Malcolm has died then people are still calling to harass the family, to threaten the family, and so on. So a fear followed her for a while. Um, and, and so in this paragraph, she says something very interesting. Um, fear clutched the widow too, even, clo even cloistered in guest accommodations at Poirier's remote manor. But she had never been the cowering sort, and she was too heartsick to dwell on the menace of the nation's zealots or the white establishment. Instead, she sought com composure. Donning Malcolm's hat was some comfort. She had first slipped it on after intruders had firebombed their home. Now its powers multiplied. It was my security blanket, she said later. When I wore it, I felt spiritually in touch with him. This is a very interesting statement. So what is this? What is she talking about? Say, before Malcolm was assassinated, their home was firebombed. So in the middle of the night, someone came through... F through like uh, some sort of uh, explosive or, or bombs through the window and the house was lit on fire and the family had to flee the home. And they fled the home into a cold night. And uh, this was the night before his second to last speech, like his last full speech. This was the night before that speech. And uh, so she, in the, in the midst of all that chaos, she wore his, his hat. Okay, she wore his hat. 
And she said that that was like the first time that it, it gave her comfort. It was her security. And after that, it was her security blanket. Whenever she wore it, she felt spiritually in touch with Malcolm. Now, why I think this is interesting is because uh, we need to consider the idea of memories and experiences related to objects and how important that actually is and how that's a, a passing thing because of the consumer culture that we live in. So has anyone seen the story of stuff on, online? You should go look up the story of storyofstuff.com, I think it is, or .org. Story of Stuff is very interesting. It's a little kind of like cartoonish uh, video. And the woman who's doing it, she talks about what is the story of stuff. Basically, how does all this stuff come to be? And why do we have so much stuff? And how is it made so that it gets broken very quickly and then we have to replace it and all of this? So what happens when you don't have any memories with anything is you have nothing that founds you. Okay? So I'll give you an example of how things don't happen anymore. When we had my son, my mother came to me and she said, I have the dresser for you. And I understood what she meant. She meant is, I have the dresser that we used to change you on when you were a baby. We had it in the house and it remained in the house and we painted it and we kept it and it was taken care of. And the same dressing table, dresser for clothes and then a table on top to change the baby that we changed your diapers on, I have now for you to use for your son to change his diapers on. <laughs> right? It's a small thing, right? But there's a lot of sentimental value to that. It's kind of like Say, for example, some of you are young. Maybe this is the first masjid that you've really been a part of. Ten years from now, fifteen years from now, you'll remember the space. If the space is still here, space will have a special feel for it. So there's sentimental value attached to spaces and experiences. This is mentioned also in the beginning of the, the Burda of Imam al-Busiri. I mentioned the Burda of Ka'b ibn Zuhair radiallahu anhu in the khutbah. But the Burda of Imam al-Busiri is the most famous poem praising the Prophet in Muslim history. In the beginning of the poem, the poet is interrogating himself, asking why he's crying. And he says, أَمِنْ تَذَكُّرِ جِيرَانٍ بِذِي سَلَمِي مَزَجْتَ دَمْعًا جَرَ مِنْ مُقْلَةٍ بِدَمِي That, is it because of the neighbors that you used to have in this place called the Salam that you're crying right now? You see what he's saying? Just seeing, remembering that place, going to that place, reminds you of the people that you used to love in that place. And so tears come to your eyes. Or maybe comfort comes to you. Or whatever it might be. So she's saying that after Malcolm passed away, she would put this hat on, and the hat would give her a feeling of comfort. Um, it's very important to consider these things. Clothes does have an impact on us. So when the question came in this, in the in the, in the thing about what is the, the sunnah to wear or whatever, right? And did that one come in the jeopardy? So I'll tell you something interesting, right? You could argue that the sunnah of the Prophet sent them in one way is to wear the clothes of the people that he was sent, he lived amongst. But you, but you know what in the end? It's probably the kids. Don't worry. Zubair's outside, so he'll... If it's not the kids, he'll handle it, inshallah. Um, the the clothes does have an impact, you know. Like when I wear a thobe and I pray in a thobe, it feels different. It just feels different. It's not any more correct. It's not, but it just feels different. Uh, another one that's for me specifically is the azhari clothes that we have that you're supposed to wear or you're allowed to wear when you graduate or when you've gone through some level of study and azhar, it's a particular gown with a particular hat. That hat is very heavy. And I don't mean physically. Like putting that hat on your head, it's very uh, draining. People have told me like, I put the hat on my head, my behavior changes. I get a lot more stern. <laughs> I just feel like I can't. This is the clothes of ulama. You can't act the same way, right? So there's, she's saying when she puts this hat on, the hat has some consequence for her. The other thing that's on the same page is you see the dignity of Sister Betty, right? So she needed things. 
And the people were trying to help her. And so one of her friends connected her to a governor, to the governor of New York and his people. And she was trying to, to tell her, you know, trying to get her to advocate with this governor to basically ask for some money. And they would grant it to her somehow, right? So the, this lady's telling the story. She said, I said, Betty, they want to talk to you. Tell them you want your children's education taken care of. Right? Tell them you want your children's education taken care of. And she said, oh, no, I can't do it. I said, you've got to ask them. She said, no, you ask. And when they came over, she said, oh, I don't want nothing. So what is this? And then she has this dignity. Like, yeah, my husband was murdered. And my kids need stuff. But I'm not, I can't ask. If you guys give it to me, I'll take it. But I'm not going to be the one to ask. So she had the strength to her. Uh, one of the things that happened shortly after the death of Malcolm, the murdering of Malcolm, was that she was called upon to ask if she wanted to make the pilgrimage. So again, she's pregnant with twins. And this is about, uh, I believe it was a month after the, the, the assassination of Malcolm. Uh, either a month or three months, but very close, either way. And she was given the opportunity to make the Hajj. And she was only days after the minister's funeral. Uh, she went on the Hajj a month later, but the only days after the, the minister's funeral, Ahmed Osman and Saeed Ramadan asked her to accompany them to Mecca in her husband's stead. So Malcolm was supposed to go with them on Hajj. He was murdered. They asked her, why don't you come with us? Anyone know, does Saeed Ramadan ring a bell to anyone? Anyone know who Saeed Ramadan is? Dr. Saeed Ramadan, rahimahullah. Um, Sa Dr. Saeed Ramadan is the father of Tariq Ramadan. Yeah, you guys know Tariq Ramadan? The famous professor, Oxford and you know, speaks all around the world and wrote these books and all that stuff. Saeed Ramadan is his father. So his father is the one who asked Malcolm or Betty to go on the pilgrimage with them. Uh, Saeed Ramadan is also someone who was very close with Dr. Hassan Hathout. Rahimahumullah. Uh, and there's a very beautiful story that I heard about Dr. Hassan and Dr. Saeed Ramadan. That they hadn't spoken to each other for about 20 years. And um, uh, they called, uh, Sa I think Saeed Ramadan called, you'll get the point. One of them called the other one, and they said hello, and he said, Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Hassan, you know, Saeed Ramadan says, Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Hassan. And Dr. Hatut says, he didn't ask him who he was yet. They haven't spoken for over 20 years. He tells him, Wa alaikum as salam, ya Saeed. SubhanAllah, look at this. So, Wa alaykum as salam, ya Saeed. He responded to the salam, Saeed. He knew who it was after 20 years. Like, imagine the love between people to recognize a voice like that. The voice just brings back memories. The voice, he knew immediately this is the voice that's on the other side of the line. So, she went on the Hajj with Ahmed Osman and Saeed Ramadan. And there are many uh, very interesting things that are said here, amazing things that are said here. It was very much um, refreshing for her to do so. And one of the things that was going on, like I said, is that not everyone, in the, especially in, in the community, were uh, happy with Malcolm. And you notice this, for example, if you, look, if you listen to uh, the eulogy of... Um, Whose eulogy is that? Ozzy Davis, right? Ozzy Davis's eulogy. And he says, whatever they tell you about Malcolm, know this. Did you ever talk to Malcolm? Did Malcolm ever smile at you? So you're, you can see that there's some tension, right? So when she goes and overseas and she starts meeting all these people, um, and, and everyone is happy to meet her, and she's almost in a diplomatic position. You know, people are trying to, they're going out of their way to meet her because she was the wife of Malcolm. And she, it says in here, here was the veneration for Malcolm that seemed so sparse back home. The Muslim world is especially reverent now that Malcolm had become a shaheed. And among the luminaries, all these kind of people met her. Uh, the Secretary General of the, Muslim, the World Muslim League, 
uh, his name was Saban, and she actually made his name the middle name of the twins that came afterwards because she was so positively uh, impacted by this person. The prince uh, of Saudi Arabia had special counsel with her, so she was greeted very, uh, very graciously. But one of the things she says was that, or it said about her, the journey had restored her emotional balance, replenished her sensibility and sense of worth, and deepened her commitment to Orthodox Islam. Though she had recited the Shahada, the Confession of Faith in One Lord, uh, months before in Mecca, she had touched his cheek. I knew after the pilgrimage that I was going to do it and that I could do it with or without help. So the pilgrimage was a source of strength for her. The spiritual strength that came along with it grounded her uh, in, in that journey. And she said she sent a, a card to Alex Haley afterwards, the autobiographer, the one who wrote the autobiography of Malcolm. Um, she said, I am indeed happy to be making the Hajj. And then she scrawled, she, she put her name and she put another alias, uh, meaning beautiful and radiant, that a female pilgrim had conferred upon her only days before. She said, my new name is Bahia. So that's why this is the name of the chapter. So this was kind of like a time of rebirth for her uh, in that journey. But I think it's important to think about you know, how, as I mentioned in the khutbah, all of these acts of worship that we do are opportunities for renewing ourselves and reestablishing ourselves and grounding ourselves. Because if we're truly in the midst of life, we're definitely in need of being grounded. And the best place to ground ourselves is to ground ourselves in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, another section here is a section about how she became Dr. Shabazz, how she got her PhD. So even with the six children, she went back to school, she finished her bachelor's, and she started her master's, and then she went on to do a PhD, uh, even, even with the six children. It was very, very difficult. But one of the things she said, which is very real, she said, people ask me, how were you able to be so strong? How were you able to be so strong? She later said, I wasn't strong, I was weak. I cried and I cried, but I knew that when I finished crying, I would have to get up and go on with my life. And this is, I think, a very important statement. Sometimes you look at people, they look so strong. They look so this, they look so that. They look like, it doesn't mean they haven't been through stuff. It doesn't mean they haven't struggled with things. It doesn't mean they don't have pains and difficulties that they go through. There's a lot of things there. But one of the people who really taught me this, actually, was Sheikh Taha in San Diego. Sheikh Taha in ICSD, Islamic Center of San Diego, you see Sheikh Taha, you know, he comes to the masjid, he starts working as the imam. Whenever you see him, he's happy and he's positive and he's doing things and he's involved in whatever and all this stuff. And you don't realize how many things this man saw in a very early age. Right? I mean, he's from Algeria. He came to the United States in 2000. So that means that he was in Algeria as the imam of his town during the civil war. So he literally washed many, many bodies of innocent people who were, who were slaughtered in the course of these, war in these wars. He literally was chosen mayor, elected mayor of his town and forcibly removed from the position on the same day. <laughs> this is, he was literally uh, had a, a, um, basically an attack on his life, like someone tried to poison the water supply in his home. Right? But you come... Happy person, very, he won't give you any hint of that. He's not going to tell you any of that. This is personal stuff, right? He's not going to sit there and like sh give you his stripes to prove to you that he's worth listening to. But it's there right, in the way that people live their lives. So she said, how were you so strong? She said, I wasn't strong actually. When you weren't looking, I was crying. It's very tough, very difficult. But they said, you talk about a woman who fought for her dignity. She was determined not to be dragged down. She was determined not to become the stereotype. It's very important. She didn't want to become dragged down. She didn't want to become the stereotype. She was able to rise above that. And her sense of dependency on all of these people was an effect, is, it, was, it, was, it was bothering her. So actually then what she did was she wanted to um, figure out how she can get into a position of economic security. And that's part of the reason that she went back for her education. And she used to say how much emphasis that Malcolm used to put on education and that this education that she's going to get is going to be a means of her upliftment and so on and so forth. And she eventually did uh, finish her PhD. 
One of the things that ma- this made me think about, you know, she says, she hoped as a model for her children to embody Malcolm's adage that education is our passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to the people who prepare for it today. This is his quote. Um, what this made me think of, and I hope that some people don't get upset with me, especially young people probably, and I hope that parents don't abuse it. But this really made me think of our parents, my, my generation and below parents. See, we don't always understand things. So we get upset that our parents are like, you need to be a doctor or you need to be an engineer. Why are your parents telling you you need to be a doctor or an engineer? Parents are telling you this because they probably immigrated and hustled really hard to get where they were, and they want your route to be a little bit easier. It's pretty much what it comes down to. Why else are they saying it? I was having a conversation with a brother today. Young people don't usually think about money. Let me give you a very harsh introduction to reality. If you are in a Muslim family, then technically the responsibility of the income of the family falls upon the man, correct? You might have a wife that works and donates her money. This is literally in the perspective of the hereafter. If she works and donates her money to the family, it's an act of charity. But assuming that the man is the one who's responsible to make the money. If you just do some basic math, okay? <laughs> basic math. You have one income and you make $65,000 a year. So it's just over $5,000 a month, right? After you lose a lot of your income to taxes, you probably end up with like 3700 And then you're going to pay rent for your family to live, your family with a wife and child and everything else, to live in a two-bedroom place. You're probably going to drop in Southern California easily in the realm of $2,000 a month on rent. So now you have how much left? Only paying rent. 1700 left. Okay? Now you take out a couple hundred for your car, take out a couple hundred for your insurance, take out a several couple hundred more for your cell phone, you already lost another thousand, right? So now you're even lower. You see how much is here? Not a whole lot is here. (laughs) Don't forget you have to eat food and you have to drive because you live in California. You have to pay for gas, you have to pay for maintenance. God forbid you blow a tire, you know. It doesn't, it's very difficult. In numbers, are very, very, they're not, a, they're not a kind opponent. You know, they don't bend for you. <laughs> the number is the number. It's the number. So there's a reason why people push these things. Because if, you know, it's hard. It's hard to live off one income in a society that's not based off living off one income. Or you might, you might work and so on and so forth. So the point is, Sister Betty decided that she needed to become Dr. Betty. So she went back and she got her PhD and she started to work at this university uh, or at this college called Medgar Evans College. Medgar Evans College. Anyone know who Medgar Evans is? Yeah. Medgar Evans was also a civil rights uh, activist and he was also killed. Um, Actually, Betty and Medgar Evans' wife and Coretta Scott King became like a little trio. They would spend time together and stuff because they were the three wives of people who were killed in the civil rights struggle. Uh, They united on this point. So she became a a teacher at this Medgar Evans College uh, in New York. And, you know, initially some people, they, they... Medgar Evans College was a college that was built upon, you know, like rights of black people and empowering them and getting them into positions where they can support their families and the community and all of these kind of... It was, it was born out of the civil rights struggle, the, univers- the college itself. And so some people were looking and, you know, they're thinking like, why is she here? Maybe she's not fully qualified and all of this kind of stuff. They said something very interesting. Her arrival was hardly more extraordinary. She peeked around the door of the school's health sciences office one morning and said good morning. She seemed agreeably mild. Though she held herself with care, her new colleague sensed that she was one of them a woman looking to serve the neglected and explore her field. Why did she want to come to Medgar Evers? Dr. Bertie Gilmore, an instructor in the nursing program, later said, because she was trained as a nurse uh, before the PhD. That's the question people wanted to know, and she answered it almost immediately. She, too, was concerned about the plight of her people. She could empathize with people struggling to take care of their family and meet ends. So what I think is important about this 
is that uh, Dr. Betty was not, she was, she didn't piggyback, she, indeed, after the death of Malcolm and with six children, she, she invoked the, her relationship with Malcolm and times that would help her to be able to better take care of her family. But she didn't piggyback Malcolm's legacy and her care for her people. She had her own independent care for her people. And this is, I think, a very important uh, concept to get through our heads. That people respected her and the struggle that they were going through and the things that they were facing because she cared for her people. It's very, you know, one of the things that's difficult and one of the things you see, you know, why the black power movement was so important was that people had to stop hating themselves in order to love themselves. And uh, I would venture to say that a lot of Muslims actually hate themselves. Uh, we hate ourselves subconsciously because of Islamophobia. We hate ourselves subconsciously because of the things that we're exposed to from the Muslims. We hate ourselves subconsciously because of all of the things that are happening in different Muslim lands. And as long as we hate ourselves, we can't actually uplift ourselves. And so we have to know our history. We have to know our civilization. We have to know where we come from. We have to know why these things matter. We have to know the languages. Don't lose languages, young people. If you have an opportunity to acquire the language of your family and your history and your blood, acquire the language of your blood. You want to go back. Sure, you're not born there. Sure, you're not raised there. Sure, you don't understand the place. It's still your home. Just as much as here is your home, where your parents came from is your home. And you want to be able to go to your home and speak the language to deal with the people, to understand the culture. You have to be able to connect. You have to have concern. The heart has to have concern for, its, for the people that it belongs to. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ قَالَ أَهْلَكَ الْقَوْمِ فَهُوَ أَهْلَكَهُمْ And in another narration, فَهُوَ أَهْلَكُهُمْ One of them with the fi'l and the other one with uh, ismu tafdil. That one of them says, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever says that a people are destroyed, then they are the one who destroyed them. In another narration, whoever says the people are destroyed, then they are the most destroyed amongst them. So we have to have hope in the people, we have to have hope in the Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ taught us that the Ummah, the nation of, his, of the Messenger wasallam, it's like the rain. You don't know where the good is. It could be in the beginning, it could be in the end. But it's there. There's good in the nation of the, of the Messenger wasallam. There's good in the hearts of the believers. There's good in the people in our community. We have to recognize the good. The good is very, very important. So, so Sister Betty was there for the struggles of her people. Uh, and, and she used to give them advices. She used to... Uh, she gave a very, very interesting... Um, people, people were sometimes upset with her. This very much falls into the discourses in the Muslim community. Sometimes, sometimes people are not as political as other people want them to be. So it says that some Medgar Evers co uh, college women were disappointed that the widow was not outwardly political. Shati was too accommodating to the administration of the school who, who, that were, they were conservative and so on and so forth. They, but they learned from her as well. Um... And, and she warned them to avoid the psychological swirl of turbulent souls. You know, that, that you have to understand. You, can, you don't understand what you guys are saying. And this is something that's very, very important. You know, sometimes young people look at older people and they think, you guys don't understand. You guys are just sellouts. You gave up on the things that you're worried, the causes you should care about and all of these kind of things. No, those people understand. They understand the consequences of things. Same thing happens with the ulama. The traditional stance of the ulama is that you don't rebel. Even if your ruler is a dictator, you don't rebel. People look at it and say, well, the ulama are pacifists. They're trying to support dictators. They want the people to be oppressed. They're sellouts to the governments and all these things. They're not sellouts to the governments. They just don't want a lot of blood on their hands. Maybe in like the Tunisian experiment of the last several years, you don't understand it as directly. But it's very easy to understand the opinion. Look at the Syrian experiment. Now this is not to justify oppression. It's not to justify dictators. It's not to justify any of that. It's just to say that there are consequences to political action that are very, very, very serious consequences. It's human beings' lives. People tortured, 
family members lost, people killed, and all kinds of things. She says, one of the things she said, you need to really be careful because you out there and you think you got your troops, but you turn around and your troops aren't there. She told Chandler, who was then an exuberant activist. She was trying to tell him, you think you're out there and you're doing all these things and these people got your back. You're going to turn around and nobody's there. <laughs> so be careful, right? And she told him also, the widow's caution to her insurgent peers was subtle but sincere. She urged them to consider their families before they plunged into struggle. She assured them that martyrdom was not as glorious as they imagined, reminding them that the masses had forgotten many of the women and men who had perished on their behalf. Her colleagues recognized that her mission was not to overturn society, but to seek reform through education. Most accepted this and embraced her as a sister among sisters who was reachable in many ways and untouchable in others. So she brought a different perspective. But the perspective is important. It's important to consider uh, in, in the context of long-term change. Um, that's the last major one, alhamdulillah, it's good, because we only have five minutes um, before, before Esha. Um, and in those five minutes, I want to make a little comment uh, at the risk of, you know, being Debbie Downer, as we say. <laughs> uh, I think that the Jeopardy was beautiful, alhamdulillah. The brothers did a great job. You know, um, sure, some of the people are looking at it like they could have done this and they could have done that. It's the only way you learn. The only way you learn is you get up there with the microphone and you deal with the difficulties of having the microphone, right? So I think that the activity was beautiful and I think that the engagement of the community was beautiful. I, I never thought that so many people would get so excited about competing with another, each other about questions related to wudu, wudu you know. Uh, and there's a complication in that question, by the way, <laughs> that the madahib differ, just for the record. Uh, I know one of the sisters said the nose and the mouth, and in one of the schools, the nose and the mouth is required on top of the four, <laughs> the four limbs. But we'll leave that for now. The point I just want to make is to keep in mind, um, to keep in mind that as much as we build community and we want to talk to each other and have fun and all of these things, it's also a musalla. So you kind of have to, there's a little bit of a balance. Now you should try to have fun and answer, answer the questions, do the jeopardy, everything like that is fine. I'm not saying the jeopardy is a problem. I'm not saying the answers are a problem. I'm not saying the groups are a problem. Nothing of that. But we should just try not to like yell and scream too much in the musalla. It's generally not from the adab of the musalla to yell and scream. Uh, but you know, it happens. And we move on. And we don't beat ourselves up, and we continue with the good work, and it's okay. You know, this is something we have to understand as a community. You come together as a community, and you do things, and you come closer together, and you connect with one another, and you have fun, and so on and so forth. And every now and then you make a mistake. It's okay. Or you do something, and something else could have been a little bit better. It's okay. It's fine. As long as the overall good was there, and it wasn't some serious harm, like if all the yelling and screaming led to everyone fighting each other in a huge brawl in the middle of the musalla, then that would be a problem, <laughs> right? That would be a serious issue. But, you know, an instance where, you know, people get a little bit excited, and it's, it's okay. I mean, it's not, it's not optimal, but it's okay. And it's, and it's okay for the greater good. Uh, but just something to, to keep in mind that we balance these things. One of the things that's really, really important about Islam is that in Islam we have fun. We don't not have fun in Islam. We just have fun in certain places and certain times. And in other places we don't. A very clear one for this, also to not pick on anyone in particular, but a very clear one on this that is very common amongst young people is they like to have fun during prayer. <laughs> you know, one person goes and they just throw the Allahu Akbar and the next person comes and like gives them a little elbow and they know that they can't do anything because they're in their Allahu Akbar, and then like this one's laughing, and this one's doing this and that. This is probably, you know, everyone has memories of these things. It's how you grow up as a kid, right? You have, and when you're a kid, you do things you're not supposed to do. But it's not the best thing, especially in prayer. I'll give you an example of myself just to tell you things that kids do that they really shouldn't do. So one time we were walking down the street. It wasn't me who did it. And I was with a friend of mine, and it was a major street. And for some reason, we were in middle school, I think. For some reason, we, he got the bright idea that it would be really fun to walk down the street and throw rocks into the middle of the street 
while the cars are passing by. <laughs> Stupid things that kids do, right? So he's like taking little rocks and throwing them up in the street and like cars are passing by and obviously cars are getting hit by rocks, right? Stupid things that kids do. So then uh, we learned our lesson. <laughs> there was a, a, a car that was with younger adults and they saw what he was doing and they pulled up right in front of us in the driveway really fast and started yelling at him and made him run down the street crying. So, <laughs> so it happens. But kids do things and maybe, you know, make mistakes. It's all right. So alhamdulillah, I would encourage. But my point is, don't take it negatively. Keep doing these kind of things. It's a really beautiful thing to come into a musalla on, the fr on a Friday night and see a community of diverse ages and backgrounds and perspectives coming together into the place of worship. And you have some young young brothers who are excited and they want to prepare this jeopardy and, and show it to the community and help them with some questions and make sure everyone's on the same page. It's a beautiful thing. So we should make dua for these brothers that Allah blesses them and increases them. Ameen. So we said, we'll make dua for them. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa Rasulillah. O Allah, bless our young brothers and our sisters who have taken uh, initiative to serve their community and who come to the houses of Allah to remember Allah. Bless our young brothers and sisters who are in the service of this deen. Bless our brother who made adhan for Maghrib and iqama for Maghrib and preserve him and protect him and his family and reward those brothers who prepared the jeopardy uh, and made that easy for them. Oh Allah, please bless the individuals and families who are behind the efforts that make all of that possible. The volunteers who are in the masjid, the administration of the masjid, the donors who give back to the community, bless them and their families. Oh Allah, give uh, reward and aid and sustenance and perseverance to those who volunteer to teach our young brothers and sisters and to support them and help them in their growth. Ameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasleema kathira. Jazakumullah khairan. And I guess we probably have the adhan. Adhan? Who's the muadhan?